Good evening. I was, uh, as I was working on the message yesterday, I was thinking about the way I closed last week. If you remember, I, I was right at the, the part of the last song, I, I was just thinking about how, well, I asked you, you know, do you know someone that has kind of been maligned and misspoken of? And, and then you saw that the light was turned on and people saw that they had good intentions, that the person was a good person. And, and, and you had that feeling of, of joy for the person. And, and you said, they get it. They, they get who they are. They get what they did. And then I, I moved into how when we prefer others, and we put on that mind of Christ that I felt like the Lord looks at us and says, she gets it, you know. And, and so as I was thinking about that um, the other morning, I thought about that's a lot about what this lesson is about, or, or really all of Philippians, because remember we, our theme is, Paul said, the, in these things I've learned, in everywhere and in all things I have learned. and And... If we've learned it, we walk in it, right? We, and, and we get it. And the challenge was to me and, and hopefully to you is did you get last week's message, the importance of putting on the mind of Christ, of humility, of preferring others? Can you look back on this last week and think of a time that you chose the well-being of someone else over your own? See, because that's the challenge, not to just move. We can move from one part of Philippians to another to another and, and think, wow, powerful stuff in there. Or we can start walking it. So the challenge is, are we doing this? Because it's in the doing that we show that we get it. Will you pray with me? Father, our hearts are willing. We, we know we know these truths in your word are the right way, but, oh, Lord, you know our flesh, and we so often fall back in, in choosing ourself. And, Lord, we, we know that is never satisfying as much as we think it might be. And so, Lord, would you take our hearts tonight, and may we hear you not only with our minds, but hear you with our hearts, hear you with our souls. And may you do that work in us that you so long to do. We give you this permission and ask that you do it in Jesus' name. Amen. As we look at Philippians 2, 12 through 18, I'm going to stop and not do 17 and 18 tonight. We'll pick that up next week. Most of our focus is going to be on verses 12 and 13. So let's... Uh, Look at these incredible words in these verses. Therefore, so we're starting out with a therefore. Based on what was written that we studied last week. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Yes, and if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. For the same reason, you also be glad and rejoice with me. Therefore, because of what Christ has done, I think this is one of the, the most powerful therefores in all of Philippians, maybe in all of the Bible, because this is why you and I are to do all that we are to do. This is the basis for our Christian walk. It's not about what we do, but about what Christ has done. He left heaven. He became man. He walked on this earth as a bondservant to give us an example. He suffered. He died. He rose again. He paid the penalty for all 
of our sins. He ever lives to intercede for us, and he gives us the power to walk rightly. He placed the Holy Spirit inside us. He, Jesus Christ, did it all. He left nothing undone as far as enabling us to walk as he commanded us to walk. We have the, the words in 2 Peter 1, 3. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. Seeing that his divine power, we have everything we need. Therefore, Paul is challenging us in what we should do because of this. Therefore, because of these facts, Paul wrote, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, look back at verse 27 of chapter 1. He says, only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent. So twice Paul exhorts them to do something whether he's with them or not. Think about that. Why do you think Paul did that? In 1 Corinthians 4.16, Paul wrote, I urge you, imitate me. In the book we are studying, Philippians 3.17, he wrote, join in following my example. So all Christians, especially those in any kind of leadership, should be always, always aware that we're setting an example, either good or bad. And Paul lived his life in such a way that he could urge others to follow him, to imitate him, to walk as he walked. But there's a line. See, we are to follow the good example set by those in authority over us, but our walk is not to be based on those people or any circumstance. It's believed that Philippians were kind of floundering in their faith. Paul was gone. They didn't have him to run to or consult. And Paul's warning them, don't even for a moment imagine that my presence or my freedom is essential for you to live the Christian life. And this hit me in a deeper way this morning as I was just going over the lesson because I thought Paul being in prison probably really threw them. You know, have you ever gone through something and, or missing something in your life and you've said, oh, if only this person were around, if only I had this, if only this situation was this way, then my walk would be different. You ever said that? Ever thought like that? And Paul is reminding them, your walk has nothing to do with what is happening to me. See, work out your own salvation, he moves into. See, don't be about me. Follow me, imitate me, but your walk, your walk is based on you and Jesus. You can't say, if only this were in my life, my walk would be better. And, and I love that <laughs> exhortation, I think, that, that we can get through this. Paul was saying, don't depend on me. Follow my example, but don't look to me. Look to Jesus. He's the one that paid the price. He's the one that bought you with his blood. He's the one whom every knee will bow to. Spiritual leaders are important, but they are never, ever essential to our walk. We cannot look to them to maintain our walk for us, nor can we blame them for any part of their, our walk. Their behavior should never be a cause of our falling or walking away from the Lord. See, what or who is your faith based on? What or who has the power to shake your faith? If your faith is based on the truths of Philippians 2, 5 to 11 from last week, on the Lordship of Jesus Christ, no matter what happens to someone else, no matter what happens to you, your faith should remain because Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He will never change. He will never change his love for you. He will never change his goal for you. He will never, ever change what he has said. So Paul exhorts them, work out your own 
salvation. Now, we know that we are saved through faith. For by grace you have been saved, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 tell us, through faith. And that not of yourself. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. We are saved by believing in, by trusting in the work done by Jesus Christ on the cross. Not by any work done by ourselves. Salvation is not a work of man for God. It's a work of God for man, isn't it? But this verse tells us to work out our own salvation. It doesn't tell us to work for our salvation. In life, you probably have worked for a job. You know, you, you do what you need to do to get hired for a job. And once you have that job, we're to work at that job, doing the things that the job entails. So when you get a job, you, you have worked for it in the worldly sense, but for us in the spiritual sense, we get a title when we give our life to Jesus. And beloved Christian, bride, and now Paul is saying, now, now walk in it. Like when you get a job, now, now do your job. As believers, we don't have to jump through hoops or do certain things or earn the title of Christian. John 1, 12 tells us, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, to those who believe in his name. Those who believe in his name received, trust in, rely upon the work of the cross, have been given the right to this title children of God. We've been given salvation. So when we say we've been given salvation, what does that mean? There are three parts to salvation. First of all, justification. That one-time act when you and I repent and surrender our lives to Jesus as our Savior. At that moment, we are justified. We are made right before God. At that very moment, we are translated from the power of the kingdom of our enemy into the power of the kingdom of our Lord Jesus. Jesus comes and frees us from the enemy's camp and places us in his territory. Just as Moses took the people out of the bondage of Egypt, at that moment, you begin to head in a different direction than you'd been going. This part of the journey, this part of the salvation process is just that, the, a process. Now, for us, we have been transported from the bondage of Egypt right into the promised land. We don't have wilderness life, praise God. You know, we are transported right into the kingdom of his son and all the promises that come with it. But that part of the journey... Although it's a process, it's where you and I have a part. We can't start there. If we've just been justified, if we've just, uh, if we haven't been justified, excuse me, and, and we haven't been saved, we can't move on to the second part. We can't live in the promised land. We can't work out of a salvation we don't have. I read a story about a little girl sitting in service and, and the minister was teaching on uh, Philippians and working out our salvation. And he said, this verse is proof that no one can be saved by grace alone. Each person must work for their salvation. And at the close of the service, a little girl asked her mother, and she said, how can you work something out unless it's already in? And, and so he puts it in. He saves us. He puts the Holy Spirit inside us. Now we're to do something with what he has done. So do you have it in, see? Are you saved? Well, how do you know you're saved? Because the Bible tells you so. And then John took a lot of time in writing his letter, his first letter. And in 1 John 5, 13, he says... These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. What did John write? He wrote the things, the evidences that you and I can look at to 
determine whether we are saved or not. And, and see, the evidence of that salvation is a changed life. John said this change in our lives would be evident by things like wanting to be in church, wanting to be in fellowship, choosing light instead of darkness, keeping his commandments. He said in 1 John 2, 3, now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Now, I did not say a perfect life. I did not say even a good life. That is not what John is saying here. He's talking about a changed life to see something different. See, yes, we still have that self core, but we're different. That self core gets convicted. <laughs> Just this evening, um, Heather sent me a text. She's been working on setting things up for us to stream the messages. And so she said, I took off all the videos to see if maybe that was a problem. Can you check on your phone? What did I think? My videos. She took off my videos and I texted her and I said, oh, mine are all fine. She goes, no, no, no. The videos that are on the, the page, each, each ministry page, you know, and I thought, oh, it's not all about me, you know? <laughs> And, and it's just like, ah, oh, I get so frustrated with, with that self part of me, but it's there. But I look and, I, and I'm different because I belong to Jesus, you know. I, I do want good for others. I do love others. I, I do want to obey what he says. And, and so John says, I've written these things to you so you can see. Are you walking in these things? You, is this what you want in your life? Yeah, that's a change. Did you want to follow God's commandments before you got saved? Did you even think of preferring someone else except for what it could get you before you got saved? No. But there's a change when the Holy Spirit comes inside. And that's an exciting change. When we are sealed with the Holy Spirit at salvation, when God takes up residence inside of us, it's got to provoke a change. You ever had someone come live with you for a while that, that didn't change the atmosphere of your home? Some people are adaptable, but see, the Holy Spirit is not. He does not come into our lives and adapt to the way you and I think and are. He can't stand sin. So he gets in there and he starts cleaning or convicting you of the dirt. It's up to you if you want to get rid of it or not. But if you're not like your guest, you either want them to change or you see they do have some good points and you change. If you like the way things are, then the way this guest comes in your, your life, it bugs you. Do you notice that you become more and more frustrated with sin in your life when the Holy Spirit comes in? Do you notice a, a keener interest in the things of God? Yes, because you're here. You know, it's Wednesday night. You could be at home. You're here because the Holy Spirit is in you. That's his job. The Holy Spirit is like a seed planted inside you, and, and this seed is alive, and it cannot die inside you no matter how much you neglect him, no matter how much junk you pour on top of him. He kind of just burrows his way through it all. And the less you cover him up, the more you feed him, the more you will hate your sin and the more interest and longing you will have for the things of God. So God works it in. He puts salvation inside us. Paul was writing to those who were already saved. He was not telling them how to get that way. So what does working out mean? It means bringing to pass. It means leading to a full result. Finishing something which has already been begun. It's continuing of the work that has already been started. Now, now God said he's faithful in Philippians to what he begins, he will finish. But now this part of walking in sanctification tells us we get to be a part of it. And we get to be a part of it. It doesn't stop with Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 that we're saved by grace so that no one can boast. No one will be able to stand before the Lord and boast of how they achieved heaven. 
Jesus achieved heaven for us, and he invited us to be there with him. No boasting in that. But we cannot forget the very next verse after Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. Ephesians 2, 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God prepared beforehand a way which we who are in Christ should walk. Working out your own salvation is kind of uh, picking up the broom and sweeping where he tells you to sweep in your life rather than sitting back and getting in the way of what he wants to do. Working out your salvation is submitting to the truths of God after we have been saved. In becoming saved, we submit to the truths of God, the truth that we're sinners, that we need a savior, that Jesus Christ alone is God and through his death and resurrection is that savior. When we submit our lives to that truth, we are saved. Now working out our salvation is continuing to submit to the truths of God's word. It's like when you have a child, you that are moms. When the child is born, all of a sudden you get a new title, mother. Never had it before. You'll never lose it. You'll always be, as long as you're walking on this earth, you will have this title of mother. Nothing will change that. Now, it's up to you to work out being a mother in that child's life, to submit to the truths of what a mother does. And see, some of those truths are, are general. Uh, all mothers are supposed to make sure their children are fed and clothed and taken care of. But then you that are moms, you know that there's a lot of individual things that, that each child needs. So you're working out your motherhood according to your title, but according to the specific calling on your life with your kids. And the same goes with, with this sanctification. We've all got general things that we are called to do. And then there are some specific things that we are each called to walk in. And we'll look at that in a minute. God is constantly working things into us. He's continually showing us things, always trying to teach us more. He exposes us to truths about himself and about us. Working out our salvation is doing something with those things. It's that continual flow of him showing and us applying. God has done something to you. He has made you what you are, and he's still working in you. Therefore, Paul says, work it out. Do something with what he has done. Now notice here whose salvation we are to work out, your own. Now there's a couple things we can see here in these words. First of all, we are to be careful to mind our own business, to not worry about how someone else is working out their salvation. Yes, we're to exhort one another and challenge one another, but we're to work out our own salvation first. See, it's absolutely needful that we work out our own salvation before we think we can affect another's lives, life. If I was on the bridge down at Mission Bay and I looked down and saw someone drowning beneath me and I couldn't swim myself, what good would I be? See, there certainly wouldn't be enough time for me to leave that bridge, go get swimming lessons, then come back and then do something to help the other person. I've got to be working on my own effectiveness first. And we were just talking about this, this tonight. If not, see, if God has not been working on me, I'm going to be one of those people that stand on the bridge and tell the drowning person what to do because I have no power. I have no inspiration from the Lord to know how to help someone. Psalm 119, 11 says, Your word I have hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. Psalmist didn't wait for the trial to hit and then scrambled to his Bible for fortification. It was already there, ready to be applied, ready to be worked out. In Ephesians 6.13, we are told to take up the whole armor of God 
that we may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. But it keeps using this word having, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. This soldier is already dressed, ready for battle. So we are to tend to our own walk first, and then we'll be ready and able to jump in and save or correct or exhort someone who is drowning. You know, every once in a while, someone will come to me and, and say something like, uh, you know, I've been asked to pray for someone or be a part of this ministry or teach Sunday school, but I can't. And I'll say, why? Well, my walk's not good. And, and I always say, then get your walk right. You know, so often we we bail on situations, we bail on working out our salvation because we're not walking with the Lord. And and his Paul's exhortation here is, work out your salvation, get involved again, so God can use you, get your relationship right with Him. Don't back off. Don't get out of the race. Get it right. Do you see your salvation as that personal? Your own salvation. I'm so glad Paul added that word own. He could have just said work out your salvation. And, and the definition, the meaning, the sense of the verse would have been the same. But I'm thankful for this word own. God's a jealous God. He's Jehovah Kana. And I'm very glad he's jealous over me that he sees me as his own, that he's given me my own salvation. It's mine. It's nobody else's. And this journey of salvation is, is mine. Your journey of salvation is yours. The destination, the third part of salvation, is glorification, Christ-likeness. That's we get that when we get to heaven. One day you and I are actually going to think like Jesus. But what's incredible there is if you got number one, you got number three. And may we never lose the awe of that. Once we've been justified, we've got a guarantee I'm going to be glorified one day. One day I'm going to be in heaven and I'm going to be like Jesus. The mess that we might be right now if we've been justified, if we're saved, we're going to be glorified. That is an awesome truth and assurance. But the middle part, the second part, sanctification. It's all different for each one of us, as I said. See, that's ours. Nobody's sanctification process is the same. Nobody's is like mine. Nobody's is like yours. We're all traveling towards heaven. But I think sometimes we see ourselves as a big clump of Christians, you know, traveling to heaven. Like the Israelites were traveling to the promised land. And, and God sees us differently. He sees us as individuals. Remember, they were led by a cloud by the day and a pillar of fire by night. When the pillar moved, they all moved as a group. When the pillar stopped... They stopped. But it's different now. See, the Holy Spirit abides, abides in each one of us. And he leads and guides us on different paths or to different places. We must each work out our own salvation in different places. Part of where I work out mine is, is right here, right now. Something that he has called me to do. Some of you work out your salvation in ministries, in school, work. We have different places. The most important place you and I work out our salvation is with those we're with all the time, typically at home. And I love the phrase, who you are at home is who you are indeed. Now, when I got to this point in the message, I thought of the fact that we each have a lane to run. Now, how many of you have heard me talk about the fact that we each have a lane to run and we need to walk in our own lane? Yeah, yeah. I'm not going to say it again. 
Don't worry, you probably got it memorized because it's just something that is important to me. But what I've uh, asked the leaders to do is, is when you get in your groups to have someone explain that, what my little thing is about that, and then talk about how the, fa how the fact that we each have a lane to run in applies to this lesson of walking out our, working out our own salvation. Because I talk about Jesus handing a baton to us to run in individual lanes. That's working out our own salvation when we take that baton, our own. It's yours, personally yours, personally given to you and designed by the Lord Jesus. It's not a gift that God sprinkles over the masses or those who looked up to him got it. He personally called each and every believer. And you personally answered. And he personally saved you. He personally inhibits, inhabits you. And your job is to personally do something about what he has done. As I was praying the names of God on Monday, I was praising him for being Jehovah Mekadishkin, the Lord who sanctifies, the Lord who sets us apart for his purposes. That's what he does. <laughs> I found myself just praising him. Lord, thank you that you have chosen to set me apart for what you want and that you have something for me, for me. So, so God sets us apart and that's sanctification. Now we're supposed to walk and work out that sanctification, what he has set apart each one of us to do. And we're to do this with fear and trembling. Oh, how does that hit you? You know, if you were brought up with the fact that, or the thinking that God's judgmental, he's harsh, he's, he's out to get you, you might see that and go, there it is, I knew it, you know. I gotta be afraid of him. These thoughts are all familiar to most of us, but that's not what Paul meant here. Uh, the sense here of, the, of this is a fear of, is a self-distrust. It's a tenderness of consciousness, conscience. It's taking heed lest you fall. It's, it's a constant awareness of the deceitfulness of your own heart. See, do you have that? I, because I, I am ministry so much, I'm so scared you're gonna see me. You know, I, I know that I need to spend time with the Lord so that if you come to me with a problem, you're not getting my thinking. Who needs Cassie, Kathy's thinking? You need to hear from the Lord. And, and I'm afraid if I don't spend time with the Lord, you're going to get me. That's ugly. I know that. And so as we work out our salvation, it, it's a distrust of, you know what? I could fall any time. This flesh, your flesh, it's not any different than the day you got saved. It still wants its way. And if you don't spend time with the Lord, you're going to be in your flesh, in your walk, in your advice, and how, you, how you're around other people. So he's saying, work it out in fear and trembling. Work it out realizing what you're like and what you could be like without the Lord working in your life. But it's a good kind of fear because that fear drives us to Jesus and then we get changed and then he works in us and through us and whoa, that's a whole lot better than Kathy, a whole lot better. It's a healthy respect for the Lord and his word. The best def definition of the fear of God that I've ever found is in Vine's dictionary. And it's a wholesome dread of displeasing him. A wholesome dread of displeasing him. That's a healthy thing, wholesome. Are you so depending on his grace that you've forgotten how very much he hates sin? Have you become so confident in yourself that you've forgotten the snares that have been designed to cause you to slip? 
and on your own, you realize there's absolutely no tread that you can put on your feet to keep you from slipping. Nike, Adidas, they're always coming out with new stuff for the soles of tennis shoes. You know, th this is gonna work. This is gonna really help you run better. We're told that the Lord makes our feet like Heinz feet. We have better soles on our feet now that our souls are saved. Have you forgotten that if you fail to take care of your own salvation, that God will take on the process on his own? Don't forget the teaching of Hebrews 12, 5, and 6. And have you forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as sons? My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. That's his part of helping you and me work out our salvation. If you are saved, he's going to get you to heaven one way or the other. First Peter reminds us that your place, your place, my place in heaven is reserved for us. We want to go kicking and screaming and rebelling under chastisement, reaping the consequences of all of that. It's up to us. But Paul in love encourages us, work out your own salvation in fear and trembling. And now at that point, we might, if we read 12, have some fear and trembling. How do I do that? That's hard. And I love the Lord for many reasons, but, but here when I see so many verses that kind of when we read them out of context and we go, wow, I'm overwhelmed. How do I do that? I'm inadequate. But see, that's where he wants us. And then we get verse 13. Remember, it's God who works in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. But, but remember, remember, it's God who does the work in you. You don't have to do it yourself. You do it with him. Oh, how you and I are so quick to forget this. Galatians 1, uh, 3, 1 through 3, Paul wrote to the Galatians who were thinking about going back to the law, thinking about doing it by works again. And he said, oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? This only... I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, you got saved by the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? What did you do in your own power to get saved? So what do you think you're going to do in your own power now? God's things can only be done in God's power. And Paul reminds us, it's God. It's God who saves you, and it's God who will continue to enable you and empower you to do this Christian walk thing. It's God who will enable you to work out your salvation. And not only will he empower you, he'll even give you the desire to do it. You for a minute think that any good thing that you want to do stems from your own goodness? Aren't you absolutely shocked sometimes when you, when you do something good and unselfish? He persuades our will. Now, it's our choice whether we listen to his persuasion or not, but he's in there working all the time. So how much are we listening? God has, I said, general and he has specific goals for us. He desires to work in all of us the work of the Holy Spirit. He desires for all of us as we work out our, our salvation to do it with love, with joy, with kindness, with long suffering, with patience. But the means by which he does that is personal. 
individually designed for each one of us. And then he's got specific callings for each one of us. God works in us personally. So he puts personal, custom-made desires in our hearts. I've shared with you my core thinking is accountant. Two plus two equals four. I remember the day that Dale was moving his office from one place to another at Calvary Costa Mesa. And I was helping him move books and I started crying. And he said, what is, what's wrong with you? And I said, I want this. I wanna be here and I wanna help women. I wanna be a part of their lives. And he looked at me and he said, Pastor Chuck doesn't hire women for that. And I said, why'd you ask me why I was crying? You know, all of a sudden I had this desire that I never had before. I mean, is that a natural desire to want to come alongside women and help them there or walk with Jesus? No. It's a God desire. And he puts those things in us. But it's our job to do something about them. But to know that when he calls you, he will empower you. That when he gives you the desire, he gives you the power. Now, sometimes he gives us the, the power, the ability, the gifting, before he gives us the desire. Other times he gives us the desire, and we don't see any ability or any power. He empowers us later. But see, if the desire is of, of him, and that's where we check the desire sometimes if we move into something and we think we want to do it, but we, we don't see the empowering, and I'm not saying we don't see him making us wonderful in it, but the power to do it and the power to love through it and the, lo and the power to push through it even when it's hard. See, if we get discouraged with that, we've got to go back and say, wait a minute, what was my desire based on? Was it the Lord? Do I feel like the Lord is putting this desire in my heart? Then I'm hanging in there till, till he gives me that power. Cindy, I'm going to use you in, as an example. Because it's like she willingly stepped forth to do this whole media thing. You know, no ability whatsoever to do it. She's been doing it for a long time now, hasn't she? She's doing a good job, and she's, she's learned little bits at a time. And, you know, I think she likes to do it now, right? Yeah. I mean, that's a change. But she submitted to God's calling, and, and she pushed through all these time after time after time where this equipment fails, and she stayed doing it. And, and that's working out what God has called her to do. And it's a joy because we get to see him do things in our life that we know we couldn't do otherwise. I tell you, 1 Thessalonians 5, 24, all the time, he who calls you is faithful who will also do it. If that verse were not true, we'd all just need to pack it up and, and go home. Oh, what a miserable people we would be if we felt this urgency to do good things and we're left to our own abilities to perform them when we came to the Lord for salvation we come we came done with relying on ourselves done with being confident in anything that could save us but Jesus and we rested alone in a confidence in him and what he'd done and we're to continue that kind of thinking utter dependence on him but not futile dependence. He gives us the desire and he gives us the power. What an awesome promise to follow right after work out your own salvation. See, it does not say it is he who tells us what to do and then makes us do it. He gives. It's up to us what we do with what he gives. He gave his son. We had to believe that and receive that and now as his children, he gives us desires. He gives us his desires for us. 
He says to you, this is what I want you to do. As you believe that and accept that working in you, he puts in your heart a desire to perform that work, and then he empowers you to do it. Your part, wanting to want it. Sometimes we have to be in that place of, Lord, give me the desire to desire what you want. And he's so gracious and he so understands us and he meets us right in that place. Paying attention to the desires he has placed in you, not ignoring them. And then stepping out. See, he won't pull on your hand. He won't stretch out your hand. But he'll do the rest when you stretch it out. He will accomplish the work. Ask him, what do you want from me in this, Lord? Often he changes our thinking, and then we do what he tells us to do one step at a time. Working out our salvation is a one step at a time thing. As a farmer works together with God for the harvest, we do the same. He waters, we hoe, we work it out, and then he waters a little bit more, and we've got to keep hoeing, and he gives the strength to us to do that. And the result will be fruit and some well done's and a smile on the Lord's face. And we will be in utter amazement wondering why. Because we knew he did all the work himself. We just got to be a part of it. He worked in us both the desire and the power. Right now, in many ways, as we're the children of Israel, spiritually speaking, justification is that step out of Egypt step out of the grip of sin. And then we are, as I said, immediately transported into the promised land to work our, out our salvation, living in and applying God's promises for us. And this God who continually desires to give us his desires and to enable us to do them. What are you doing with what God has worked into your life? Don't settle just for salvation. One day there will be an award ceremony in heaven. 1 Corinthians 3 tells us about it where our works will be tried. How we worked out our salvation will be tried. 1 Corinthians 3.15 says, if anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. So again, we're not talking about salvation here. We're talking about how you and I live our lives from number one, justification, to number three, glorification. See, the things, even if they're good, if they're our idea, if they were done to benefit us or to please others, done in our strength, they'll burn. Why? Because they gave no glory to God. And somehow when those awards are given, it's going to bring glory to Christ. Paul's earnest expectation, that's what he wanted to do. That was what he was about, bringing glory to Christ, both on earth and in heaven. Go for the rewards. Go for the crown. Work out your salvation in such a way that your works will remain and the rewards you get for them can be laid at the feet of Jesus for his glory for his honor. Now, in verses 14 and 16, we have some specific instructions. He's been very general, work out your own salvation. Now he gives us a couple specifics. It helps me to know why. God doesn't have to say why. He can just say, I'm God, I said so. But I do like the, the answers sometimes, and we actually get some in these verses. The purposes of why we are supposed to do these things, we find in Philippians 2.15, that you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. So first of all, we do that so that we're to shine. We're to live a life that others can't find places to blame us or accuse us of sin a life that does not cause harm to others, that we live a life like a child of God should live. And then in Philippians 2.16, it says, so that, Paul says, I may rejoice in the day of Christ 
but have not run in vain or labored in vain. So Paul wanted to hear a well done from Jesus. He wanted his work to be effective. In Galatians 4.1, he says, I'm afraid for you, lest I have labored for you in vain. 1 Thessalonians 3.5, lest by some means the tempter had tempted you and our labor might be in vain. So concerned about that. He cared. And, and you may think, well, well, that sounds selfish. You know, the second reason is, so I know that I didn't run in vain. Keep in mind, his goal was to honor and glorify Jesus. Paul knew that if he ministered to them in the right way and they chose to follow him and walked as they should, then he could rejoice because it meant they got it. It meant that Jesus was honored. And this is the, the heart of a shepherd. But notice how the section began. Paul wanted them to shine, not just in his presence, but in his absence. Not to impress him or depend on him. And, and I thought of loving Paul the way the Philippians must have in the time that he spent with them. And whether they wrote letters or messengers came back. But what would you do if someone you, that had mentored you, that, that had spent a lot of time with you, that was effective in your life, was in prison and hurting? Probably do something. So what can I do? What can I do for you? How can I help you? And, and as I looked at it that way, I could just see Paul saying, do this for me. Walk. Work out your salvation. Walk in a way that honors the gospel. Do this for me. So he gives them these instructions so that the power of the gospel shows. Show the power of the gospel. That, that's what I want. That will do the most for me. Now going back to verses 14 and 16, just what actions did Paul say would accomplish those things? He said, do all things without complaining or disputing. Keep in mind here the goal that Jesus be honored. If you did your homework on these two words, the definition of these words was really convicting. We tend to think of, of complaining as complaining to one another and murmuring to one another, and we would say, yeah, yeah, I know, I know. But murmuring within myself complaining within myself, doubting God within myself. Wow. See, these words say that too. And, and why is that so important? Not only because God knows, but how we think will come out. You know, God talks about faith being so important. Why? Because if we believe him, we will act upon what we believe. If we complain, it's going to come out in talking to someone or it's going to come out in our behavior or lack of walking with the Lord. So he brings it all back to not even secretly doubting or complaining to the Lord. Now, David did it. David was a great example of complaining before the Lord, but he always took it to the Lord. He didn't just internally complain and doubt God. It's like, why is this happening to me, God? But I know these things about you, God. And he ended up praising. So we're to do that. But, but he says, do all things without complaining or disputing. Because if we complain and dispute, even in our hearts, we won't shine, will we? Disputing speaks of an inward reasoning, questioning of what is true, hesitating. See, what starts in the heart or the mind will come out. See, we've got to settle in our hearts that God is good. And what he is doing in our lives is, is always good. In my devotions in Hebrew a couple days ago, I, I read this and, and I've been thinking about it a lot since. Hebrews 5.8, though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. Even though Jesus was God's son, God allowed suffering in his life. 
great suffering. And you know, that was comforting to me because it's such evidence to me that suffering in my life or in your life has nothing to do with your value to God. Here we have, though he was a son, God allowed him to suffer. So we are to shine. And then the instruction of verse 16, holding fast the word of life. And that can also be translated and probably fits, fits his context better. Holding forth the word of life. Both true. If we're working out our salvation, we've just got to hold on to the word of life. But if we're, it's working in us and it's working out, then we're going to hold it forth to others. And it'll be evident by how we live. So for you and me, see, how we live between justification and glorification really matters. It, it really shows whether we get it or not. As I talked about earlier, see, our response to these kinds of instructions, our response to how we work out our salvation will show whether we really get it or not. Just not believe it intellectually, but when we get it, we'll walk in it and we'll go from the, I know I should, to, I want to, because he'll get the honor. Let's pray. Father, we praise you and thank you. Praise you that you inspired Paul to write thir verse 13 after verse 12. Because, Lord, it's such a good reminder that as we're walking in what you've called us to do, you're going to walk with us and you're going to show us what to do, and you're going to give us the power to do it. And so, Lord, help us in those places where we're scared and we're afraid and we look at ourselves. May we just look at you and know you've got us. And may we, would you put in us a desire more than we've ever had to work out our salvation for your glory and your honor. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning as we were worshiping, I, I thought this is going to be the time. You don't give me anything to close with, Lord, and, and I, I'm good with that. I went over, so, you know, maybe you're telling me I talked too long. Uh, but right at the end of the, the last song, I, I saw this wheelbarrow just full, and I felt like the Lord saying, you know, sometimes when... When my children say to me, okay, I'm, I want to work out my salvation, they see me coming with a wheelbarrow just dumping, okay, here are all my desires for you. And it's overwhelming. And if that's you, the Lord sees that. And, and we have this promise that he daily loads us with benefits, that he daily gives us all we need to meet whatever is going to hit us. He daily gives us all we need to meet these desires that he puts in our heart. But, but I thought of myself and I thought, you know, if he puts just little things before me in the day, what is my reaction? Well, I can do that. <laughs> you know, I got it. And then the days when he takes a couple big things and puts before me, what do I say? Oh, I can't do that. And, and he says, look at me. You know, I will give you the desire and the power to do whatever I give you every day. And I'm going to give you bits at a time. I'm not going to dump on you my whole desire for your entire life. I'm going to put on you in the morning or during the day my desires for you. And our job is just, yes, Lord. Yes. God bless you.